Um, I want to present our next speaker. It's do Dr. Jerry Rushton, who's an associate professor of pediatrics at Indiana University. He's the director of Indiana Pediatrics Residency Program and an active leader in graduate medical education. Uh, he continues health services research projects and leadership roles with the American Academy of Pediatrics on ADHD and mental health care. He's a general academic pediatrician in his clinical duties and a father of three kids. Um, he's going to talk to us today about the ADHD toolkit, coordination of systems in the evaluation and diagnosis of children with ADHD. Thank you very much. I'm very humbled and honored to be here. It's very exciting, this conference. It's also most exciting to hear that there's parents and educators at the same time. So I think it's really exciting for the region and, and it's nice to see worldwide people that are dedicated not only to children, but children with these issues that are sometimes lower, I think, in most medical systems and the mental health issues that are sometimes overlooked in every part of the world. So we're certainly still walking that path too. We're going to shift gears a little bit more to talk about diagnosis. So you've heard about all these issues. How do you put these together as a clinician to help diagnosis? One of the most exciting things that I think that came out of the guideline work that I was affiliated with in the Academy of Pediatrics is the toolkit. And I'm, we're going to talk through this, mainly do an intro now. After the break, at 3.30, we're going to break out in one of the smaller rooms and try to walk through hands-on because I think it's very useful. Some of you have your own diagnostic interviews uh, set up, but this is a nice communications tool that you can give to families, and, and we'll talk you through that, how that works. So I'm going to talk a little bit of an overview about this as well, but I want to put it in some context first. There are no disclosures other than I am a member of the Academy of Pediatrics as well, to note that, and, and the Academy is one who helped develop the toolkit, and thanks to Dr. Alyamani and others who helped get this translated. It's very exciting to, to pull this out of English. It's been translated into Spanish and Arabic. is very exciting. The goals of my talk are first to discuss the context of systems for care, children, families, and providers. Second, to describe challenges in effective recognition and diagnosis of ADHD, which you may know fairly well. Third, to share some strategies to implement guidelines using the AAP toolkit. And fourth, to consider how these principles can apply to your own practices and cases. And I think that's the part I'm excited about in the next workshop, to make it a little more interactive, to say, how might this work? What's your current practice? What would work? What would not work? How do you adapt this? As an overview, I'm going to go through just a little bit of background literature and science as well, introduce you to the toolkit briefly, consider some issues, and set the stage for the afternoon workshop. This is a big busy slide, but just to say there are many systems involved here, and I think hopefully we have physicians at the hub coordinating things from school, from parents, uh, from social services, from mental health, and I think our job is to pull all of these things together and we can all be catalysts in this area. This is quite another busy slide, and it's intentionally busy to show that these red drops show that there's fallout at every step of the way. To provide good care from presentation to a child that goes off to college functioning well. There's a lot of steps in between, and I think our families can fall through the cracks at every level. So our job is to help engage people once they come to your office and say, I'm concerned about this issue. How do we make sure that we collect information on diagnosis, coordinate input from schools, have them come back for evaluation, set up a treatment plan, come back and titrate their treatment plan, maintain long-term therapy. You've already heard some data that a lot of families we know will drop out, not come back for a visit, not fill out forms, stop taking medications. And these are all challenges for these long-term ideal outcomes. And I think that's something in medicine we sometimes don't do as well. If it's an appendicitis, you take out the appendix, you're done, you feel good about it. Chronic care is, is a lot more challenging. I think that's what we're talking, building systems to support that. Current practice, as I've said, the complex system has many pitfalls. There's really wide variations in ADHD care. I'm sure that's true within the region here. I'm going to present some data from the states. Even a very local school level, you'll see wide variations in treatment practices and diagnostic practices. I think pediatrics is often not equipped to provide longitudinal care, as I said. And it really does demand a team approach and coordination across the systems, as some of the literature below has shown. This is some work we did in Michigan, and the geography is not important, but just if you look at the black and gray bars and white bars, it forms this patchwork quilt. This was looking at, in our Blue Cross insured system across the state of Michigan, how many children were on a stimulant. The dark black is 10 to 12 percent. 
the white boxes are 0 to 2 percent. And you can imagine the population is fairly homogeneous, so prevalence should be pretty similar. But you can see due to different diagnostic practices, that results in different treatment practices. And there's probably some overtreatment and probably some undertreatment. But I think we're trying to be guideline and evidence-based to even that out as well. But I think it's very striking that we have this in the states, as well as I'm sure lots of region, that the carry is really variable. Our goal is to raise the bar so it's a lot more consistent. So that's why I'm glad you're here to learn about these things and hopefully provide care that's more consistent and quality. The majority of the US used um, the guidelines, I think, was an attempt uh, by a lot of very bright people through the Academy of Pediatrics. This was published um, actually in 2000 and 2001, the guidelines on diagnosis and treatment. Uh, American Academy of Child Health Psychiatry came out in 2007 with guidelines that I think are helpful too, to refer you to. But the guidelines gave us a roadmap to work from, and then the toolkit and some of the dissemination helped move us from there. And I think that's where we can maybe go in other areas, and, and we're hopeful to share that information and experience that we have. Unfortunately, as you know, physician practice is hard. We all think we know what's best. We develop our own systems. You get comfortable using that. So very few physicians we found used all of the recommended concepts, still less than a quarter maybe. We are doing a, probably a better job in, in diagnostic methods, largely because of the toolkit, which is very easy to use. So I think that's certainly helped in diagnosis. Uh, treatment is still somewhat variable as well, and I think the follow-up and especially documentation we're not quite as good about writing out and following up. So I think these scoring systems are useful for that regard as well. Well, now that we've gone through just a little bit of the brief literature, I want to introduce you to the toolkit itself uh, before we break here shortly. It was developed, as I said, based on Academy of Pediatrics guidelines. It was grounded in the available evidence primarily for school-age children, 6 years to 12 years, which is largely the biggest part of the population, the most of the literature. It's actually undergoing review and some minor revisions we hope will be out in the next year. I think it's actually uh, been submitted for publication in pediatrics. And sorry, I couldn't uh, steal or take an advanced copy for you, but we'll look forward to that in the next year to update. They're actually looking at expanding into the preschool age and the older ch uh, child age as well, too. The toolkit, you have a copy here if you're interested in the full toolkit version, which has uh, versions in English and Spanish, as I said. NicheQ is a quality initiative where you can download copies. You can actually send your parents there and empower them to look at information that will go through. There's lots of different parts to the toolkit that I think are very nice. There's information not only on diagnosis, but treatments, side effect management, daily report cards, some of the things we talk to. I think it's, you know the concepts. How do I concretely tell the parents, here's what you need to do. Here's how we go about diagnosis. There's a lot of information there in the toolkit that's very helpful and empowering to them. As I said, there's parts for parents. There's uh, diagnostic forms available for teachers and information for physicians as well. I think it's very useful to implement change in practice and address barriers. You can even have a nurse and an assistant or sometimes the family themselves to use these forms and, and save time. We don't have time as much as you said. Sometimes the clinical global assessment scale may take an hour, the full interview. In pediatrics, we often have 15 to 20 minutes to do a very quick initial assessment. We'll often have them come back. So getting this started, having some forms that they can do in the waiting room or outside of the office is very helpful to us. And I think we always have to consider the cultural societal variations and applications of the toolkit. As we'll say, there's always a little bit of a danger to simply check off a box and say we're done with that. What's developmentally appropriate, what's important to society, and going back to the issues of impairment, that's where your physician judgment comes into play. But I think the checklist is a good starting point. The toolkit itself has uh, several sections that I mentioned. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit on diagnosis and the evaluation form. It's based around the Vanderbilt scale, which was uh, developed by Mark Woolrich. People have mentioned the Connors form and other forms. The nice thing about this, it, it's very easy to replicate. There's copies available to download. You can buy packets from the Academy of Pediatrics. So I think that's been a lot better. The Connors and some of the other things were very difficult to score, maybe not as intuitive for families and teachers to understand. So I think that's made the toolkit very applicable and when we go through that in the workshop, I think you'll find that it's ease of use is a, a big benefit. As I said, there are some treatment uh, issues with medication management, questions that come up quite a bit, uh, side effect management. 
Um, there's parent information, as I said, on schools and lots of things that are in the toolkit. So you've got just part of that uh, that's in your handout, but as I said, online, there's a lot of great information that you can adapt. You may not use all 20 parts to this, but you may pick two or three that you really like, and you may decide to adapt some of these letters for yourself. The Vanderbilt form itself is focused on diagnosis. It's DSM-based. I think often in pediatrics and fields outside of psychiatry, DSM sounds a little mystical to folks. They're used to just looking at children in the office or talking to parents in a vague, kind of uh, unfocused way, and I think it's very important to go through that structure, and this form is very nicely based around the DSM criteria. As I said, there are parent and teacher forms, and one of the hallmarks we talk about is getting information from schools as well as families as well. It's easy scoring, as I said before, that we'll walk through in the uh, workshop, and includes some other items and, and coexisting conditions, so conduct disorder, oppositional defiance, anxiety, mood disorders, some brief screens in that are included, which is nice. So it's ADHD plus some of the common issues. These, as a reminder, are just the core tenets of the diagnostic guidelines. Some of these are fairly intuitive, but I think they're worth repeating. First, we expect everyone to conduct an evaluation. As everyone here at the conference, I hope, buys into, this is not something that you say, oh, it doesn't exist, you'll outgrow it, it's not that big of a deal. We should take this very seriously. So the first tenant is that you should conduct a full evaluation. Second, as I said before, you should use DSM-based criteria. It's most useful to have that structure. Third, to obtain parent information, and ideally other family members, mother, father, when possible. Fourth, to obtain teacher information. That's often a difficult barrier, I'm sure, for you, but this form helps. We sometimes fax, email, tell the parent to take it to the teacher who brings it back. It's very difficult. Teachers and physicians are very busy, so to communicate, it's very difficult. But this tool allows you to facilitate that communication with the teachers that I think is very helpful. Fifth, to consider coexisting conditions, which is very important. We're not going to talk about as much the differential diagnosis, but I think ADHD can be very tricky to diagnose. And the final thing is other extensive labs and evaluations are not necessarily indicated. Um, certainly, for children that may have hearing issues, a hearing screen would be indicated. We talked about lead, some of the environmental toxins, if those are suspected should be screened for if you have neurologic conditions on examination or any family history. You're going to go deeper into this evaluation. But again, the core, as you know, is that good physician history, physical, structured interview, and diagnostic forms that I think are very important in that way. A lot of families in the states really want an answer. They want a blood test. But trying to redirect them that this diagnosis is made in this way is useful. And I think this form helps the family see that there's some scoring and method to it. It's not just uh, a doctor's thumbnail look at this. The Vanderbilt scoring helps break things down into the inattentive subtype symptoms and the hyperactive impulsive symptoms and then the combined type. As we've said before, sometimes that has important implications um, for your management strategies. There are several comorbid conditions that we talked about that can be useful to screen for that are often more complicated and deserve other types of management too. And final piece that we've been talking about a lot this afternoon, the functional impairment and performance scale that's in there that's very useful. It's not just simply a matter of doing a checklist, but how are they being impaired? The toolkit also has some aspects that flow into the treatment guidelines. I'm not going to go as much into treatment. Day two tomorrow is very focused on treatment and management, so you'll be hearing more about that later. Um, but just to orient you that there are some toolkit items there. But I think if you go through diagnosis, uh, diagnosis is important to set up treatment. It, it helps set your treatment goals, which may be very different for individual children. It helps review your progress. The big part of this is having children that come back after you've started management to see how it's going. And to reassess if you're not having success, if something's not working, we should go about this in experimental scientific fashion. Careful diagnostic evaluation and documentation, of course, are the key to success. I think just some brief pearls about this along the way, which may be well known, but just to say, uh, symptoms must be present greater than six months. So if you go through this checklist and you find that this is not a long-standing disorder, if it's brand new, all these issues came up in the last month, you should be more suspicious about other causes that are not ADHD for a more acute presentation. Onset should be before age seven years, usually in the preschool period. So it's very surprising. Maybe some children with inattentive type are missed until later years, but I think you should be very skeptical if there's not a long-standing history, often at a young age as well. 
Third point, explore inattentive symptoms which may be under-recognized. I think some of the speakers before mentioned this, um, and I think that's important to consider too. Fourth, consider perspectives of different reporters. We might talk about in a discussion. The really hard part gets to be if teacher says one thing, parents say the other, mother says one thing, father says the other. That's the artful part of communications as a physician. It's not just simply checking forms. A lot of times there's agreement across the board, but when they disagree, and in some ways that's helpful to have this tool to say, father thought this, mother thought that, or the teacher says things are going great, what are the problems at home? That helps you get into that discussion as well, too. I think the key, as we've said several times, not to belabor the point, but the level of impairment, not just simply the number of, system, of symptoms in scoring is very important. Diagnostic challenges, this is something maybe we can get into in other questions as well in the workshop. I think coexisting conditions when it's not simple and pure ADHD, although that's very difficult, I don't know that pure ADHD often exists, it's, it's often more complicated, but especially when you have other conditions like prematurity, newborn intensive care survivors, low birth weight outcomes, other developmental delays, autism, learning disabilities, cognitive delays, mental retardation, oppositional and aggressive subtypes, I think this makes the diagnosis very challenging. Young children, preschools, and teachers where info may be limited as well as difficult. And I think the key is knowing developmental norms with what's abnormal. I think Jim Swanson earlier this morning showed you this slide that there's this bell curve. There's a fairly normal distribution. That's where you as developmental pediatricians, psychologists, psychiatrists, you have that knowledge to say what should a four-year-old child be doing? What should an eight-year-old? What should an 18-year-old? What do we expect? Because this shifts over time. You have a lot of parents that come very early, and I think they can still have parenting interventions, but you may not make that diagnosis in the same way that you would for a school-age child. So I think that's very important. Checklists can go so far. You have to use your uh, physician judgment as well. The scope of care and when to refer, I think, varies within your systems, whether you're at a regional hospital or a smaller place, and this is probably very different across a lot of regions. Uh, my perspective is I'm a general pediatrician as well, so I work in a university setting. I get referrals, but I also refer on to child psychiatry too. And in your systems, I think talking about uh, screening is important. I feel it's important to start the diagnosis even if I may not provide definitive treatment. And that's a role we've taken on in the states to have a lot of providers involved in diagnosis, even if they're not comfortable with the ultimate treatment. They start the ball rolling and decide, is this not a problem or is this a problem? or a big problem that needs further help uh, from a referral specialist. So I think that could be a role that we hope to maybe develop and talk about different models that work for different regions. This of course depends on workforce availability, but most of you are probably here because there's not enough workforce that's trained to go around. The medical home and the family wishes I think are often emphasized and very interesting to think about in your role as coordinator in all this. There's other potential issues, financial and insurance in the states. Family wishes, I think, can be a big part of this. We've talked about tailoring care in an individual way. And when to refer if there's significant diagnostic uncertainty. I think if there's complicated coexisting conditions, if there's need for intensive behavioral management, that's often beyond what I can provide in the office. And if there's a lack of response to the initial treatment. This is kind of my experience when we tend to refer as well, but again, that may differ. We might talk about that a little bit later. But coming back to the core of this, I feel comfortable that most of you can start with this diagnostic evaluation, even if you get into complicating factors that you may refer. Uh, Dr. Irfan was talking about wait list, and it happens in the States too, of months to almost up to a year to get in to see a referral specialist. So in the meanwhile, those kids are suffering with a lot of the things we've talked about. So starting that process, I think, is very important. Well, let me close with these last two quick points. Consider issues in your care system that's relevant to you. Implementation principles, there is some literature on this. Factors associated with successful implementation of guidelines, it first must be based on sound evidence and have physician agreement. So hopefully you're learning the underpinnings and the biology of this so you say, yes, I understand. This is important and has an evidence base in science. You have to have the adequate time, payment, and structure and supporting resources. I think that's always a challenge for us. You have to have somebody in your practice that makes this their passion. Uh, Dr. Al Yamani has certainly been uh, a leader here and has brought us in for this conference, but we hope that this ripples out, that each of you goes back and becomes a leader in your local area or your uh, system and engages other people that get involved in this. Outcome expectancy, you have to have believe in success, you know, that diagnosis really does matter. I think it's really important in that way. And there may be some other factors depending on types of physicians and families too that 
uh, may impact your ability to successfully implement guidelines. There's lots of results from quality improvement projects that I won't go into, but in asthma, diabetes care, this is one of those chronic care conditions that we really can improve care upon. And systems interventions is very important. So even though we like individual champion physicians, you can't do it alone. You have to have a good system of support too, and that needs to be built. There is some evidence from the MTA study that improved many of the short-term outcomes in intervention over usual care. So back to this initial statement, just going about your own business may not be best serving children, may not provide good uniform evidence-based treatment. Improved processes of care and other medical home models, asthma, diabetes, have shown better outcomes, lower blood sugars, less hospitalizations for asthma. You can extrapolate some of those same things to ADHD care and view it in that way. And parents are much happier with this approach as well, too. They feel engaged and empowered in this. They're not angry at the teachers. They don't refuse to come back. So uh, outcomes may vary, and I think Dr. Swanson will talk about that a little bit, and uh, Dr. Jensen. But nonetheless, parents feel a lot more supported and satisfied with the process when they're engaged in this way. So the last thing I want to say as well is that um, some final thoughts. We're closing down today, but uh, we're going to break here at the end of this talk. And I may actually wait on my questions.